know, uh, I'm so grateful to be able to be able to um, be there during this time. And I'm also looking forward, I think that today they pray for Saji and Suja and Miss Caster and Ethan. Next weekend, we're going to be in Gran Sabana, it's called, in the jungles of northern Panama. We're going to be three days there, and it's going to be a medical mission. They don't know what awaits them, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be good. I cannot guarantee, but it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're going to join a team of um, two nurses, a doctor and two technicians from, Pan from, from Panama and drive into the jungle from her headquarters. It's going to be at least three or four hours there and we're going to stay there for three days and people are going to come from our different places where they live up in the mountains. Some of them are going to walk four hours to get medical mission. And what's going to happen, uh, me medical treatment. And what's going to happen is that as they stay there, most of them are going to stay and sleep over. Every night we're going to have a service there in the mountain at the Baptist church that we're going to be, at one of the little churches that we're going to be there. So please, please pray for us during um, these next couple of weeks and all the work that's going to be done there doing our medical mission. Could you please open your Bible to the book of First Corinthians? First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine. Could you help me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will take control of your servant and every heart and mind here, that we will go to your word in reverence and fear, and that we will be challenged, nurtured, and excited about what your word says. Thank you so much for giving us your word, that we have it complete and perfect with us today. Be with us as we go through it in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of the letter of 1 Corinthians is one of the most um, difficult letters there is in the Bible. It's a totally different book than any other one you, you will read in the New Testament. Because Paul deals with a whole lot of issues that was going on in this church of current. This church of Corinth, I believe one of the um, worst situation they had is that they thought they were so good and spiritual. They couldn't see all the other problems because they were fooling themselves and thinking that they were so spiritual. To the point that they were questioning Paul's authority and they were questioning Paul's calling. So you have to write this letter in order to put a lot of things straight in the church, but also when it comes to the middle of the letter and, and in this section here, it's going to play out and put out his defense as an apostle. And as we go to the chapter, as we read through the verses, he's going to mention Many things that even though they are truth, there's just one thing I want us to rescue from what he's saying. Because he's going to make a clear point here about himself and the gospel, which is the most important thing that tied the entire book together. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we read, Answer yourself this question. How far I am, am I willing to go for the gospel? How far am I willing to go? What am I willing to give up or sacrifice for the gospel? Read with me if you would please, beginning with chapter, in chapter 9, beginning with chapter, verse 1 and 2. Here... 
he asked the question, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, the Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. He's going to start asking a whole list of rhetorical questions, which answers are obviously yes. But he does that to make them realize and think and go back to when he himself started that church. Others may question my authority and ministry, but you better not. You are the seal, he told the Corinthians. You are there, or that church exists, because of my ministry. That's basically what, he, what he's saying. You are the seal of my apostleship. And then he go on verse 3 and says, My answer to them that examine me, or accuse me, is more examine me, is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the veteran of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planted a vineyard and eat it not out of the fruit thereof? Or who feeded a flock and eat it not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or say not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muscle the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn. Doth God take care of the oxen? Or say he yet altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that treasured in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is a great thing as we shall reap your carnal things. Pause there for a second. Those who examine that they had a right, he says. He asks them, can I do I have a right to eat? Do I have a right to drink? Do I have a right to bring a sister and have her as my wife? Like the other apostles do, even Jesus' brothers and even Cephas with his, with his Peter. That's a fine verse to let us know that all the apostles have, fam have families. Even Peter had a wife. And they had families. And then he says to them, Am I and Barnabas the only one that cannot forbear not working and receive financial support like the other, like the other apostles? Even though he received from time to time offerings from other churches like in Philippians chapter 4 verse 16. But he says, do I have the right for doing this or for having that? Even God mentioned it to Moses, he says. Thou shalt not put a muscle to the oxen that work. Did God say that because he cared for the oxen? How does he care for us? Of course he said it for us. Haven't I, haven't we given you the spiritual things? It is so much, it's a big deal to get the material things. And all these questions are going into the mind of the Corinthians and they're all rhetorical because of course he got the right. Of course he's an apostle. Of course he has, and, and, and if, if, if he's wanted to, he can do like the others. But then come verse 12. And here you see the heart of the apostle Paul. He says there in verse 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister 
about holy things, live as the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar, with the altar. Even so, had the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live as the gospel. He said, I have the right, but I have renounced that right. I have the right to obtain and to do all these things. But I have renounced those right because I don't want to suffer to be hindered to, to, to the gospel. The apostle Paul is saying, I will not abuse that power in other but instead are gonna suffer all things that verse 13 and 14 is greatly abused and misinterpreted today where he says that he that preached the gospel should live from the gospel today sadly many people or many or some preachers will take that verse and say yes i live from the gospel but the Bible doesn't say in any place that should be a life of luxury. Or you should live from the gospel and make a market of the gospel. Or you should take the gospel of just for vain glory and to line their pockets. You see this so-called ministers on TV today saying, oh, God told them in a vision that they need a $50 million airplane for the ministry. And charging people and convincing people to give the words their carnal desire. Well, they will have to answer to God. He says, in verse 15, I've done, I have used none of these, my rights. None of these, my, my rights. Neither I have written these things that I should be done unto me. It is better for me to die. Look at verse 16. It were better for me to die than any man should make my glory in void. What Paul is saying for him was such a joy was preaching was such a joy being part of the gospel and be able to preach the gospel and take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world was such a joy that he were willing to suffer all things even renouncing his rights to have a life to have a family to get him paid even if he had to work to sustain and go, for he was such a joy that he said he would rather die than do anything to hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who is, who, who is talking here? How can this be? Because that is not how Paul started. Young Paul, who was known as Saul, he was a fanatic Religious terrorist. That's who he was. A fanatic religious terrorist. One who will go in into houses and drag women, men, and children and put them in jail because of their belief in Jesus Christ. One who will get letters of authority who caused the death of the first martyr of Christendom, um, Stephen. Why? Because he was a jealous, fanatic, religious terrorist who murdered and persecuted Christian. But now, now something changed. He says he would rather die for the thing he used to persecute. I rather die if I hinder. That that I used to persecute. What was the change? His change happened on the way of Damascus when he met Jesus. You see, there is a change when you meet Jesus. There is a transformation when you meet Jesus. There is a transformation of your desires. There is a transformation of your, of, of, of your goals. There is a transformation of, of what makes you think. Now there is a motivation in him that is above everything else. Renouncing even his own desires and rights of life solely for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I would rather die. 
How far would I go? How far am I willing to go for the gospel? What am I willing to give up or sacrifice? And this was in a pride. This was in pride in the in the in in in, in in, in, in Paul's heart, he was in pride he, that because he preached, but a divine appointment and burden what was set upon him. Read with me, if you would, please. Verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself, what it says there? A servant. Literally, even though I am free from all men, I made myself a servant. I made myself a servant that I might gain the more. And we see that all through his life and testimony. There was a time that Paul received a whooping because of the gospel. I was thrown into jail. And you know what he did the next day? He walked out and said, listen, I'm a Roman citizen. You're not supposed to say to do that. I, I'm a Roman citizen by birth. The people got so scared that they tell him, go away, go, go, go. He said, no, no, you put me in here, you come and get me out. I always wonder, why in the world you didn't say that before? But the moment you saw the whip going up, why did you say, hold on, hold on, a Roman citizen? Why did you take your green card or your passport or something? So they stopped. No, he took it. And he was thrown in, knowing quite well that he could play that card. But why he did it? Because he was opening a door to be able to give and preach the gospel. To represent Jesus Christ. He said, I made myself a servant. Willingly put himself low, make himself a slave to others. Put him himself low. What am I willing? How far am I willing to go for the gospel? What am I willing to give up? What I'm willing to sacrifice for the gospel. In verse, in verse 20, in verse 20 he says, and unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might be, that I might by all means save some. He went to the Jews and acted as a Jew, not being obligated to participate in all their observances, but did it to be able to read some. Without offending God's moral law, he went to those that needed it, understand it, that were in ignorance. Within the limits of the word of God, he humbled himself even before those that were weak to be able to share the gospel and to gain some. He made himself. I remember years ago, a lady from Mosaic invite, um, asked me um, a petition. She told me, Pastor, would you please go to Guatemala? and preach to my family. Will you go to Guatemala and preach to my family? I only travel to countries where I'm going to have ministry. That's how I do it. I get a lot of invitations 
to go to different places, but I only go to places where ministry is going to be um, done in the way that I think it should be done. So she asked me, could you stop by in Guatemala? I said, well, let me see what I can do. It happened to be there was, a, there was a, um, uh, what you call it, like a deal going down to, to Peru to go to, to Guatemala and back to Peru. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down to Peru. I'm going to preach from Monday through Friday. Friday night, I'm going to take a plane over to Guatemala. This is another seven hours up. Get there on Saturday morning. Go to your family. And on Sunday evening, go back to Peru to continue on Monday. I say, I will keep, I will have my family together and preach, preach to them. Say, okay. So we did that. And I thought she was in Guatemala City, the capital. She lived in a place named Puerto Obarrios, which is like five hours away from the capital, in winding roads and dirt road. And I'm like, okay. So not sleeping that night, somebody picked me up at the airport, and we started driving, and driving, and driving, and driving. After a couple hours, I said, where are we going? Oh, we still had three hours more to go. Where is this place? Then they tell me, I say, okay. As we're getting close, it's nighttime, almost 7 o'clock. I'm tired. I want to sleep and take shower. It's Saturday. Sunday, I'm meeting the family. We're going to have a service, and then I'm heading back down to Peru. Somebody called the gentleman that was driving and said, Pastor, there's a church in our city, in our town, that is having a vigilia. A vigilia is a all night service. It starts at seven o'clock in the in the evening and it goes till seven o'clock in the morning. Are you saying anybody done that before? Behelia? No? Oh, we should do that here someday. <laughs> so people sing and preach, sing and preach, sing and preach all night long. And they heard that you're coming. We never had nobody from the state. Nobody visit us. Will you go and preach to that church? I don't know that church. I don't know nobody. But you sure? I'm, I, in, I'll tell you the truth. I'm going to be honest here. I tried to get out of it saying, tell them I'm a Baptist preacher. You know, Baptist preachers are like, you know, just by saying that, it's like they, I felt they're going to go, oh, no, no, we don't want him here. They called by and said, no problem, come on. I said, oh, Lord, I really wanted to sleep. Got there in a big auditorium and like 500 people there. They sat me with, with the pastors and it was, uh, I can't even say what type of church it was. It was the church, apostolic church of the something, something. And I'm like, God in heaven, what am I doing here? And then the singing started. And you can just imagine the singing. They had everything going on there. Even the horn, the sofa. They had the sofa and they blow the sofa. And those people, it was like a stadium. Like, like, you know, something like if the eagles would have won, that's what it looked like. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm praying. And now was my time to preach. And I said to myself, I cannot leave here without telling them the truth. I may never come back. They might kick me out or pull me down the pulpit, but I cannot leave there without telling them the truth. Folks, I started with the um, inerrancy of the Bible. What you call it? Uh, inerrancy, that's the word? Of the Bible. How can we trust the Bible? Then I asked, how many Bibles are here today? I'm not kidding. From about 500 people, there were only at least 50 Bibles. Everybody was using their phone. And I said, no, you, you, you're not going to learn like that. And we went on and went on. Started in Genesis. Starting with the promise in Genesis 3.15. Went through the prophets. About 
40 minutes into the message. I said, are you tired? Should I finish? They said, keep going. Kept preaching. Then went into the signs of Joel. Went into Pentecost. Speak about tongues. The sign of, tongue, of, of, of tongues and, 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 and all the signs that Jesus gave and miracles and wonder how the Bible is superior to all of that. And, therefore, and in any way, they're already gone. They're not for this time. There was silence. Should I keep going? They said, keep going, preacher. To make a long story short, I ended preaching almost for two hours and 15 minutes. The pastors came and say, whenever you want, come back. We never heard preaching like that. We never heard preaching like that. We didn't know a lot of things that you were saying. Can you bring us a conference here? Paul went into the Parthenon. And the Bible said when he went to Athens, his spirit, his spirit, his soul was so grieved to see all the idols and the paganism and the idol worship that he was so grieved in his heart. How can I preach to these people? What, how can I say, how can I, how can I present Jesus? And all of a sudden he walked and there was an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. And in the spirit he said, yes, that God I will preach about. And there in the pardon, he, he, he stood up and preached to the Athenians the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, he found the opportunity to preach in that pagan temple. Because for Paul, it was about the gospel. And he made himself of all of this. Why? Verse 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake. And this I do for the gospel's sake. Oh, far, what am I willing to renounce, give up, sacrifice for the gospel? Am I willing to sacrifice and give up my time, my money, my desires, my dreams, my plans, my future? Oh, far, am I, am I willing to go? Paul renounced all his rights. That were rightfully his. But he put it aside. Not wanting to be a hinder. Or abuse it. Or be robbed of the joy. To be a servant of God in preaching the gospel. Today, more than ever, we hear folks protesting rights. In the family, in society... Everybody wants rights. Everybody protests and desires more rights. And nowadays, more rights is equivalent of doing more of what I want to do. And nobody can tell me anything. The gospel attitude is different. The gospel desire is different. The gospel mindset is different. Is to give up, is to renounce, is to put yourself low, is to put yourself under, is to say whatever it takes I must do in order for you or them to know about Jesus, to give out the gospel that I'm willing to go to do. I might not have to die for the gospel. But am I willing to walk across the street to speak to my neighbor? I might not have to die for the gospel. But am I willing to look at the other side of the office and speak to my co-worker? I might, I might not have to die for, for the gospel. But am I willing to give up some of my time, my precious time that I invest on Netflix? 
to find something to do to serve others for the sake of the gospel? Is the gospel that really important to me? Because it's easy to sing about it. It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to fellowship around it. But it's a totally different thing to live about it. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The gospel is not religion. The gospel is actually a way of life. A way of life. But am I willing to renounce or give up or sacrifice for the gospel? How far am I willing to go? As we sing the next song, let's meditate in the apostle. Let's meditate how he surrendered, how, what he gave up, the rights that he could have and enjoy. Not seeking, but seeking rather to present to man the gospel, the clear message of salvation for Jesus. You see, in the book of Romans, Paul says of himself, I'm a debtor. He thought and said that I am in debt. I am in debt to Jews. I am in debt to Gentiles. Kind of saying, Lord, you could have chosen anyone. You could have chosen anyone. But you chose me. I'm in debt to them to also have an opportunity like I did. To respond to the gospel. To hear the gospel. And that becomes his life motivation. How far am I willing to go for the gospel? I invite you to stand as we sing the hymn, I Surrender All. And with that, we'll be dismissed.
God bless you all. See you Wednesday.